Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning worship. We thank God for this day. Please, can you join me as we share our call to worship? May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. Our heart is glad in God because He is blessed with God's holy name. Let us make a joyful noise to God with the songs of praise. We praise you, O God. We acknowledge you to be the Lord. Please join me in our opening prayer. O oh God, our guide and guardian, you have led us apart in the quiet of your house. Grant us grace to worship you in spirit and truth, to the comfort of our souls, and the upbuilding of every Enable us to do more perfectly the work to which you have called us that we may not fear the coming of the night when we resign into your hands the task which you have committed to us. So, not with our lips at this hour, but in word and deed, all the days of our lives, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. today we have our church conference coming up on 24th that's next week at 6 to 8 and it will be through zoom uh, please pray for that meeting please join me as we affirm our faith we believe in the one God creator and sustainer of all things father of all nations the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and 
prosper. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the word of God, containing the Old and New Testaments, as the sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the church, because you are united in the living Lord for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God as the divine will realize and in the family of God where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for the gift of life. We give you thanks for this time that we are gathered here to worship you. This is also a time, Lord, that we are nearing thanksgiving. And now, Lord, we want to say thank you to you for taking care of us throughout the year, throughout the halves and the downs of life. You are our strength, our hope, our rock, our help. In you we take refuge. And in you, Lord, we move, we live, and we have our being. We trust in you. Even, Lord, as we approach Advent, that your blessings will be upon us and your spirit will guide us. Our needs, we bring them to you. The sick, bring them healing. The crying and the grieving, bring them comfort and consolation. To those that are lonely, may they experience your presence. To the caregivers, give them your grace. We pray for the peace of the world. And pray that, Lord, your, your light will shine in all corners. The darkness will go away. And your people, Lord, will live in love, will live to enjoy the fruits of the Lord. Be with us and hear our prayers, even those that we whisper to you in silence. For this is our prayer of faith through Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thou will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptations, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Amen. off glasses on good morning I brought my flashlight with me this morning I use it when I'm in the dark so I like to keep it handy in case the power goes out or I need to search in a dark place I have to remember to check the batteries or I might not have light when I need it today's scripture story in today's scripture story, Jesus tells us a story about some folks who are in the dark waiting for their friend. It was a big day for their friend because the friend had just gotten married. Once the wedding was done, the friend and spouse were coming home in the nighttime. Now remember, in Jesus' time it was really dark because there weren't any electric street lights. There weren't any street lights flashlights, or cell phones to light the way. The friends were waiting using their oil lamps. The oil in the lamp works a lot like batteries work in a flashlight. If, if there were no batteries, there was no light. 
the same for the lantern or lamps. If there was no oil, there was no light. So in the story, Jesus says that some of the people who were waiting for their friend had their lamps run out of oil. When that happened, they left to get more oil. But while they were getting more oil, that's when their friend, friends walked by. This was too bad for them because their friends had all these other friends with them and everyone had a lamp and it was like a parade of light passing by. The friends who left to get more oil missed their friend and the parade of light because they thought providing their own light was more important than being with their friend when they appeared. In a lot of ways, we're like this flashlight. We are meant to shine with God's light and love and care. Sometimes, though, we think we are supposed to provide our own light, our own batteries or oil to make our own light. While we are trying to make our own light, we miss Jesus' invitation to gather together to receive from God what we actually need to shine God's love. But when we follow Jesus, this is one of the things he teaches and reminds us, that we are to receive God's love, hope, and care. And when we are filled with God's love, hope, and care, we have the fuel that is needed to share and to shine with God's light, helping those around us to know and see God's love. That's the good news for today. Let's say a prayer. God, please help us to receive your light so that we can shine with your love and care and be your parade of light for those around us. Amen. we receive thee, O Lord, and mercifully direct and enable us by your Holy Spirit that all things which we do in your name may be truly taught in thee, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Gospel writer Matthew is telling a story, otherwise known as a parable. He is putting the words here initially in Jesus' mouth, and Jesus is saying, I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to the one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. 
the word of God for the people of God. meditation of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock. Amen. Dear friends, church, family, our today theme is serving Christ by serving the poor. Soon, we are entering in the Advent season and in between the Pentecost and Advent, we celebrate the reign of Christ Sunday. It is the only Sunday in the church calendar when Christ presents himself as both the Savior and the Judge. Jesus' reign will bring peace in the world. In Christ's reign, God's people will be governed by love, kindness, and justice. In the reading for today, Jesus elevates all people to an equal status, teaching people to share everything equally and to offer justice to all. In the reign of Christ, the rule of love will excel and justice will not be denied to anyone or given selectively. Today, we encounter Jesus giving his last sermon that resembles a testament or last ones. This sermon was given at the beginning of the Passion Week. Most of us are familiar with the stories of Passion Week, recorded in all the Gospels, that is, the Gospel of St. John, St. Mark, St. Luke, and St. Matthew. Jesus entered Jerusalem during the Passion Week in preparation for his death on the cross. Unlike all other narratives, when Jesus spoke of the kingdom of heaven recorded in Matthew, this sermon is unique in that Jesus emphasizes the separation of goats and sheep, meaning people from all nations and announces the reward for each party. This sermon is not like the parables discussed in earlier parts, where we encounter the parable of the ten virgins and the one of the merchant lending initial capital to the people who will pay it back with interest upon the merchant's return. In those parables, both the bridegrooms and the merchant return date is unknown. The brides and the servants who were loaned money are always supposed to be ready. The last section of this chapter points to a specific event, the reign of Christ. And its plot is about a future event and how the event will unfold. Whereas the first parables encourage the believers to remain prepared for Christ's second coming, the last section paints the scene of the last day when Jesus will return to judge the world. Jesus will come in his glory, accompanied by all his angels, and on arrival, Jesus will sit on the throne in the heavenly glory. This splendid scene is also referred elsewhere as the day of judgment. On that day, Jesus will be the master of the day and will call people from the global nations to give account of their faith and of their works. The judgment is universal. It includes all people, irrespective of their faith and their beliefs irrespective of their regional location, gender, orientation, culture, customs, color of the skin, 
socioeconomic status, socio-political rank, or religion. No one is excluded and the judgment is based on faith and works. I suppose that Methodists will easily walk through the question and answer session, responding in the affirmative because we teach and believe faith without works is dead. You remember that John Wesley often quoted the quoted this once. Work like you never die, and love God like you, you will die tomorrow. Last week was late Sunday, and various late ministry reports attest to our practical work. Except for the Methodists. Other Protestant denominations emphasize faith alone that leads to less attention on works of mercy. The social justice agencies appear more attuned to the theology of faith and works. However, the millennials are all out today arguing for the fair share. They seek fair racial justice and promote equality more than the silent generations before. This reading raises a question. Do our good works make us holy, or is our faith in response to God, grace, God's grace and gift of salvation? Something to think about. This is a theological question we need to answer. Matthew, 20 verse 1 to 16 narrate the salvation by grace where Jesus spoke of the master who hired laborers and paid them at his will. The story illustrates God's prerogative to offer grace, not because of our works of mercy or our love for God or others. We respond to God's salvation in faith and live by faith and our great responsibility is to love others in one and deeds. Genuine Christians walk the talk and not preach water and take wine. In chapter number 25, Jesus is judging believers based on their failure to respond through words of mercy. A mature Christian always responds to God's free gift of salvation by seeing Christ in others regardless of their situation. When God saves a person and the person goes on to be God to others, God gives them the means to do ministry. The more you make the God self in you available to others, the more means are provided. But the less you go to the ministry, the less the means are offered for ministry. According to St. Matthew 25, Jesus will separate the sheep and the goats, and set the sheep on his right side and the goats on his left. Jesus is a fair judge. He will offer each person time to appreciate or appeal the decision, and thereafter, Jesus will give a final verdict. To the people on the right side, Jesus affirms them for being Christ to others. Jesus turns to them and narrates how unconsciously they provided food and water, hospitality to strangers, clothing to those in need of clothes to keep them warm and to revive their self-esteem. Doing ministry of presence by journeying with the patients in hospitals and prisoners in prisons. It appears Jesus is affirming the people who advocate care for the poor, the lonely, like those shut in, the elderly in senior homes, the windows living alone, the orphans, people who do manual labor in farms, businesses, and homes, and the homeless living under the bridges or standing at the intersections begging. Jesus is joining the genuine people in their advocacy for human rights, human value, and human dignity. These are the people who are ignored and marginalized. Jesus is speaking for the people discriminated by socioeconomic status, political, and the intentional plans to inhibit others from enjoying life. Jesus reminds us 
that poor people belong to the right side of God. Jesus unequivocally appreciates believers who live by the power of example, who are practical in everyday life, and who invite the poor through their assistance with little things they do to alleviate their suffering. The unchristian and Christians who live for themselves are cast like the fig tree. A few days after preaching this sermon, Jesus cast the fig tree for lack of fruit on his way to Jerusalem. It may not be a surprise that the people Jesus who place on the left side may have been baptized. They may be churchgoers, people who admire church rituals and do self-promotion, but have no room for others. Jesus says, these people are faithless and prayerless, people and hypocrites, and Paul calls them go empty gongs. If you can recall 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, that says, whatever you do, if you have no love, it's just nothing. Jesus is aware that faithful Christians offer to help other people even without seeing Christ in them. And those people who get help can know Christ through the help they receive. Faithful Christians help because Christ influences their giving. These Christians, good deeds are part of their daily life, such that they do not realize every time they do the good deeds. Often, these mature Christians may not even recognize, may not be able to recognize God in their literal giving because it is like something that has become part of their DNA. But God identifies this giving as righteous. Often, those Christ-like Christians are surprised when others appreciate their literal things and elevate the givers into righteousness. Jesus will offer the people on his left side an opportunity to justify their literal deeds to the least of these brethren. And when they fail, Jesus will condemn them to being unable to be Jesus in those, for those in need. These people do not practice works of mercy, but they promote their bad righteousness and expect it to be called good. And when other people refuse to affirm, they are surprised. The people on the left side will be asked to leave and they walk to the eternal fire. Jesus summarizes his sermon, warning each person will receive a reward according to his or a good literal deeds. Jesus' sermon on the mount reminds us, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will inherit eternal life. Jesus is asking us to practice ministry among others despite their situation, but to be very careful not to ground ourselves while helping others, but help as we are able. There are many lessons to learn from Jesus' discourse that prepare us for eternity. Jesus reigns with God and is given authority to judge humanity on the last day. Jesus lived among us and knows us. Therefore, we have no excuse to lie or hide and our, and our shells all culture. Jesus' judgment is not limited to Christians. He is the savior and the judge of all humanity. There is a judgment day and there is eternity and the eternal fire. Over the years, theologians have debated on eternity and the eternal fire. Jesus affirms that these places exist from the very beginning and he determines which part will belong to each. I would ignore all the debates and believe Jesus. Serving Christ is a daily ministry we do in very literal deeds, like giving a cup of water to a thirsty soul, a land of food to a hungry person, saying hello to the lonely and despised. Jesus is in every needy person, the majority of the saints, the Catholic saints and men, and women who did literal things. We remember people like Teresa of Calcutta, St. Patrick, St. Francis, or the 20th century people including Chuck Finney, Nelson Mandela, Bishop Tutu, Dora the Day, and other modern day people of our cities and neighborhoods 
that we know of and we can talk about. Doing social justice ministry among the poor is to be done not for self-gain or pride, or to demoralize the receiver. The ministry is done in a way to maintain the humanity of the receiver. Their self-worth, value, and dignity should be preserved. Benevolence makes the receiver a friend who continues to search for the source of our generosity. When a receiver finds Christ in the highest of the giver, that contributes to the receiver's faith in Christ. And after confession, they begin a regeneration journey that improves their self-esteem. Finally, we learn that eternity is for those who have confessed Christ and who offer to help others even without seeing Christ in them. The receiver may know Christ through the help received. The salvation and the power of giving comes from Christ. Amen.
Thank you so much. We have come to the end of our service. May the peace and the blessings of God be with you and keep you till we meet again. Amen.